On this episode of Speaking of Higher Ed, conversations on teaching and learning. The key to um, it truly being high impact rather than just a, a label on a course or, or on a professor is, is that the, the students really are understanding what they are learning. So it's a lot about metacognition. It does take time and um, really dedicated faculty, I think are the ones that look at these and really consider how can I better engage my students? How can I be a better professor? I think we take for granted the input of students sometimes and they're the ones that we're teaching. So we should really think about how can we best engage them and their feedback is so valuable. Welcome to Speaking of Higher Ed, conversations on teaching and learning. This podcast is produced by the Center for Instructional Innovation at Augusta University. I'm your host, Andrew Everett. The purpose of this podcast is to create a resource that will help you create engaging and meaningful learning experiences. This is episode four. Please share this episode and subscribe. New episodes are released the third Wednesday of each month during spring and fall semesters. Today we have two guests with us. They are... Hi, I'm Quentin Davis. Hi, I'm Hannah Bennett. Thank you both for being here. Dr. Davis is the director of Augusta University's Center for Undergraduate Research and Scholarship and an associate professor in psychological sciences. Dr. Bennett is the undergraduate program director and associate professor of kinesiology here at Augusta University. So the listeners can get to know you a little bit. Uh, I'd like you both to briefly tell me about the professional path that led you to Augusta University. Dr. Davis, let's start with you. Sure. Thank you for having us. Um, my background is in psychology, so my undergraduate degree was from a small college called Maryville College in Tennessee. I was interested in communication and, um, and animal behavior, and that led me to two graduate programs uh, about communicating with chimpanzees and mm. communicating um, through the signs of American Sign Language. Um, as I was finishing my dissertation, I moved to Augusta to take a job as a lecturer in, in the Department of Psychology then, and ended up staying, finishing my doctoral degree and, and moving into a tenure track position here, uh, and got very interested in um, not only communication with children, um, but also communication by students about what they were doing. And that sort of led me into a deeper, deeper appreciation and um, interest in undergraduate research and scholarship. And so I ended up taking a full-time position uh, in that department about four years ago. Wow, that's, that's interesting. Uh, so you, you made an interesting transition, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Dr. Bennett, what about you? Uh, so um, my background started in psychology also. Um, so my undergraduate's in psychology from the University of Connecticut. So I grew up in Maine. So moving down south has been quite the journey. Uh, it's <laughs> been very different. Um, but clearly something has gone right because I've been here for a while now. Um, so after UConn, I ended up at Georgia Southern and got my degree, my master's degree in kinesiology and sports psychology. And that's kind of where my, uh, my training is. And then I moved to Tennessee and went, did my doctorate in human performance at Middle Tennessee State. Uh, it's about 30 minutes outside Nashville. Um, and then when it was time to apply for jobs, uh, I applied for a position here at AU, and that was eight years ago. And I've been here ever since. And I've been program director now probably for the last, I'm going to get this wrong, but maybe five years. Um, and it's, I, I love it. Um, it's I love our students. I think they're great, uh, and it's a really rewarding place to be. So did you live in Augusta, Maine, and then end up in Augusta, Georgia? Or, you know? <laughs> no, um, I lived in Bangor. So uh, if you are Stephen King fans, uh, that's where he lives. Um, it, but I do, having friends that and family that still live in Maine, it's a bit of a conversation to remind <laughs> them that I don't live in Augusta, Maine any, like, at all, and I live in Augusta, Georgia. Very interesting. Well, we're both glad you're here today. So let's get into the topic for this episode, which is high impact practices. And I'll ask the first question is probably probably the most obvious. What are high impact practices? Dr. Davis? 
Sure. Um, high impact practices um, is, is a very broad term. That HIP term really is a label to describe teaching that has long-term memory effects for students. So practices that years down the road, students still retain that knowledge of whatever the topic was. And there are practices that um, have been identified by George Kuh, um that we'll, I'm sure, talk about today that really allow for that better retention of knowledge. And, and so we'll get into some of what those I, uh, specific practices are. But long-term memory, retention of the, of the material is really the one thing that kind of binds all of these, these practices together. Hmm. Any, anything to add, Dr. Bennett? No, I think that's a really great uh, way to describe them because when we're thinking about how do we impact student learning throughout their life, we're trying to make lifelong learners. And it's, it's much more than having them memorize like, a, you know, content for multiple choice tests. This is, this is stuff that's going to help them be better practitioners or clinicians or teachers or whatever it is that they go into because of how we structure them in the classroom now. So what are the benefits of high impact practices for students? And then how do we communicate those benefits to the students? That's a great question. I think there, there are lots of different benefits, so I hope that we can kind of toss around a number of those. The one that comes to mind first is probably not um, the most academic, but it's fun. <laughs> it's that, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, typically when students are learning in a way that is hands-on, that is um, really deep, uh, deepening their knowledge, Students know when they're just learning just for the test. We've all done it. We've been there. Uh, Everybody knows how that feels, and you kind of do a brain dump um, during a test or a paper or whatever the assignment might be, and then then you move on to whatever is next that you want to learn. And so um, I think that, that students really enjoy learning with these kinds of practices. Like, for example, even high expectations is one of the elements of of high impact practices. And students like it when we expect more of them. It's kind of, you know, children do the same. So uh, you give them too much room and they they kind of lose respect, lose interest, and, and it's just not as engaging. And so having high expectations can often um, initiate a, a more motivated learning experience from the student. And I think that, that that's something that they really just enjoy. Hmm, interesting. So what, what, what do you have to add? Well, I think talking about like reducing the engagement gap is really important when it comes to high impact practices. We, we know when they're trying to learn things for just content to learn. Um, but I think it's about helping them recognize that they're learning without telling them that they're learning. Um, These are activities that they like to do, that they can relate to, that they can find value in, and they don't feel like we're just lecturing to them all the time. Because we we all know if if you have students and you look out in the lecture hall and eyes are glazed, someone's sleeping, someone's on their phone, like you've lost something, Hmm. you've lost someone. And I know we can't get everyone every single time, and that's the reality, but how often do we do we think about changing our modality to engage them much more frequently? Um, sometimes in academics, I feel like we get very pigeonholed into just PowerPoints and lecturing, and I feel like that really reduces our engagement gap, and high-impact practices really bring that up. Um, it, it, makes, it makes learning way more fun to the, to the students. And it's not that we have to tell them, oh, you're doing a high-impact practice just by doing it and seeing them being engaged with one another, working together, having conversations, um, having debates and discussions, um, they don't recognize that they're actually applying the material and learning and engaging. And I think that's one of those hidden uh, benefits of high impact practices when it comes to students. So now you both led faculty learning communities last year that focused on this topic of high impact practices. Can you share your experience leading those communities? Uh, Dr. Bennett, you wanna start? I really enjoyed it uh, because it's so in the Chris and Barry is where kinesiology is. We're a little bit siloed from a lot of other people, so we don't get to really, um, really mingle with people from health sciences. And even in Somerville, we're not here very often. Um, but it's really nice to to have like-minded individuals want to come together and actually talk about what they do 
and then help each other. I think that was one of the biggest benefits that that I found in working with the 10 people that I had in my group is that some people had great ideas, but they didn't know how to potentially implement them. Mm -hmm. And I might not be um, an expert, let me back up, I know I'm not an expert in something like nursing. Um, So hearing from nursing what they were doing, how can I make that translatable to kinesiology? I think that that was really valuable for for me Um, and kind of just bouncing ideas off one another and just having a discussion about what, what is it that other people are doing and how can I potentially mold that or edit that to better fit my students. And people are really open to that. Because I think in this group, there's a lot of people, or all of them are very like-minded of, we're focused on the students. How do we better engage them? How do we encourage them to want to try harder, to challenge them? Um, And I found it very valuable, just the discussions that other people, of what other people were doing in different departments. Hmm. And what about your experience? Yeah, I completely agree with Dr. Bennett. This is, um, you know, the way that the, faculty learning community worked, we had a structure um, of, I don't know, maybe five or six different assignments throughout several months. And we would come together to discuss what our particular plan was going to be for our particular class. Some of the faculty chose two classes that they wanted to implement a strategy in. Some people chose one. um, And so it was very Um, customized to whatever that faculty member wanted to do. And we had uh, faculty working with PhD students on all the way down to freshman composition classes. So it was a wonderful breadth of um, diverse classes and students and needs. But the discussion, the same thing happened in our group, was that the discussion uh, between the faculty was just amazing. They leaned on each other for support. We oftentimes went into topics that were tangentially related, but also very important to teaching and um, really elevating that experience for students. And they were very motivated to find, how can I do this? And I really want to try to... um, Try something new this time and just see what happens, see what sticks. So it was it was a great experience. And what are some of the examples of the strategies that came out of your groups that faculty implemented in their courses? Yeah, um, we had a couple different faculty who were very interested in the practice of um, frequent feedback to the students and continued feedback. So a traditional, a more traditional way of giving an assignment might be that you have students um, write an outline for a paper, for example, and write a draft, and maybe they turn in one draft, get a little feedback, and then have the final paper due at the end of the term. Um, Some of our faculty this last uh, semester were instead having much more in-depth feedback and much more low stakes feedback, so more frequent. So maybe the assignment was every two weeks rather than every two months or something. Mm -hmm. And so the students really felt like they got um, better guidance and better support from the faculty member with very little um, uh, worry that they were going to, you know, bomb the assignment and if they did then what would happen to their whole grade so the the fact that they were low stakes um assignments and and in some some of the cases i think the faculty didn't even have any point value assigned to these assignments mm-hmm. but the students still did them because they enjoyed the hmm. the constructive criticism that um was helping them develop and that's kind of goes counterintuitive to what some of us think might happen with students that they don't want to do that um but uh what our faculty were telling us is that they were super engaged and the students loved it. Hmm. So students students enjoyed this. They recognized something was different. Yes, and that's another, um, I think, important piece of the high impact practices is um, it's technically TILT, which is transparency and learning and teaching and, and really telling the students why you're doing what you're doing. And the students seem to respond much more um, appreciatively, maybe, Mm -hmm. and at least with some more understanding rather than this is just to um, have some busy work or get an assignment in. And so the faculty, 
that I, I recall doing um, assignments where the students reflected about why they were learning what they were learning and what the objective was and the faculty member sharing what the objective was was uh, very fruitful. Mm. Yeah. Anything to add? Yeah, I'm thinking about um, both the, the the feedback part is was very valuable and some people in, in our department or excuse me, our group um, there's there's one about working over a period of time, whereas you're not just asking them to do a group project at the end of the semester. Yeah. You're actually giving them, um, so if it, if it is a group project, maybe you're having them make their groups in, for spring semester, we'll say in February, meet with their groups um, by mid-February, and then in March, you have a plan of what you're going to do. In like By the middle of March, you've already created your outline. So it's it's having it spread out as opposed to, and it's also helping teach, teach them time management too, um, because we know that at the end of the semester, students are so burnt out um, as, as professors are t as well. And the, uh, the, I feel like sometimes the lack of, of caring about those assignments goes down. Um, and so if we give them more time to do it over the whole semester, we're, we're helping them recognize that you don't have to do it the night beforehand. Um, and time management is very important. And working together is also very valuable because I feel like there are very little, there are very little jobs that where you're not going to be working with someone at some point. Um, and those long projects over time help people learn how to communicate better, how to work better together, see who's going to step up and be the leader of the group. How are they going to divvy things up? Um, it makes group work a little bit less <sighs> What's the word that students like to use? Um, well, they don't like group work sometimes. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but it, I think it it helps group work be. It shows them that it's much more than just trying to get this project done by the end of the semester. So, when you're designing your course, let's talk about some of the uh, key elements that you can use to ensure you're using high impact practices in um, what you're designing. So I think if we take a look at the syllabus and kind of the way I like to do it is I look at last semester syllabus and I look at the content areas that I cover. And then I think about what high impact practices can I start to integrate and intertwine. Um, so I teach working with diverse populations. And I mean, working with diverse populations in general is one of the high impact practices. So how can I look at that topic and inter interweave it, not just in the content, but in the projects that they do. So for me this semester, what my students are doing, they're in groups and they get to pick a diverse population of their choosing and then act like they're teaching us a workshop. And they're gonna teach us how do we better work with this population. Um, and if we're our, if in our future, well, I guess in the students' future um, careers, if they encounter individuals with this uh, maybe this disability. I know one group is doing visual visual impairment. Um, how can we be more competent practitioners when working with them? Um, so that's a way in which you can incorporate um, the experiences with diversity part in HIPS. So start with the syllabus. Yeah. Okay. And what else? Yeah, I completely agree. I think to really um, faithfully implement a high impact practice, it takes it takes planning, mm -hmm. and so. Well, it's not that you can't implement some of the elements of high impact practices in the middle of a course. Ideally, the faculty member is thinking about um, whether they want to incorporate research or some sort of introduction to an internship or if the internship is its own course, um, then those are obviously planned ahead of time. Um, service learning is another thing that uh, faculty can implement, but that takes a lot of work on the on the faculty members' um, side to find community members that would be willing to take them on, maybe a nonprofit or a news station or whatever that might be, where uh, for that particular um, discipline. Um, really laying out what the goals are and what you expect to get out of it through that particular high impact practice. So um, service learning is one of the easier ones, I would say, to implement mid-semester because you potentially could get that done in, in, say, a month or so. But if we're talking about an internship, that's obviously going to need to be done ahead of time and the whole course is an internship. But 
even in doing so, making sure that the students are reflecting on that process, reflecting on what they learned, what went wrong, what could have gone better, um, you know, what skills they're developing. So the the key to um, it truly being high impact rather than just a a label on a course or or on a professor is is that the the students really are understanding what they are learning. So it's a lot about metacognition. I am realizing that I'm learning this content and that I'm applying it in X context. And so um, that that's piece of it, the, the metacognitive piece is extremely important. Um, and that I think that's one thing that a lot of faculty realize is that they might have done a service learning project, but there wasn't a big reflection piece about mm-hmm. it. And therefore, it, it bleeds more into volunteerism, which there's nothing wrong with volunteerism. That's great. And we want, we want students and faculty to engage in that. But that's not the same as an academic in-depth experience mm-hmm. where you're really going deep into a topic and not just kind of touching the surface. Yeah, and I, I would think the intentionality of faculty is is very important. Um, yeah. I think it goes back to, I know we all, we all need breaks and we love breaks and they're important, um, but also recognizing that it might be more than just a week before the semester that you need to start thinking about how can I start implementing some of this stuff because it does take time. And implementing one in your first in your first go around is, is wonderful. You don't have to do all of these in one semester. Um, it, it'd be really hard to also mm-hmm. do all of them and do them well in one semester. Um, so kind of starting small and figuring out what's one of the easier ones that I can integrate in this semester and then next semester, how can I build on that? Uh, but it does take time. And um, really dedicated faculty, I think, are the ones that look at these and really consider how can I better engage my students? How can I be a better professor? And there are, the, the high impact practices have eight key elements to, to help ensure that you are using the high impact practices. We were just discussing a few of those. How important are these eight key elements for actually having effective high impact practices? I, I think that they are truly key. I think that, I mean, the, it is what it says. Um, without the elements, the labels really, again, just don't mean much. And so um, I think it's it's just vastly important that faculty just take a look at, um, at what those elements are. And I'll just name a couple. One of them that we've mentioned so far is frequent and constructive, timely feedback or significant investment of time and effort over an extended period of time. So what Dr. Bennett was just speaking about with that group project over time, that those kinds of um, activities really, really make a difference. Or public dis- demonstration of the competency, uh, whatever that skill is in that, in that discipline. Um, those are some of the elements that, that really make these much more genuine learning experiences. Yeah. Anything to add? I think you really covered it on that one. That was. <laughs> oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> well, so let's. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and and they're they're super important for obviously creating this in fact effective uh, high impact learning experiences. But it, like you mentioned earlier, reflection is key. And so, what are some uh, some I would say some ways to create these opportunities for a good reflection and self-assessment for the students after they've been through an activity? So uh, for so I'm the internship coordinator for our hours, and so that's a whole course in and of itself, and that's 12 credit hours. Um, and so we have students that go out into the field, and every two weeks they have to give me a reflective piece about what they've been doing. Um, but at the end of the semester, I always give them their own evaluation about what it is that they've learned, um, what they wish they had learned from the site, um, things that they didn't expect that they were going to encounter, um, things that we may have prepared them for, but maybe also didn't prepare them for, because that also helps us become better instructors in the classroom. Um, that's one of the ways that we kind of do an informal reflection piece at the end of the semester, because um, their internship is, is pass-fail, so they don't necessarily get a grade for it, but it is still a very important part of 
the culmination of all of their kinesiology classes. So it's the last thing that they do. So did we prepare them enough? Um, and if we didn't, where did maybe we miss the mark? Um, but also, what are things that, that they learned? What's valuable about the internship to them? If someone was to say, I want to go to this site, what would they tell them? What did they learn from that? Um, and I think that's a very valuable piece, especially for students that are going into internship later in semesters. Anything to add? Yeah, I think that's great. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to do reflection. And I think the more creative you get with it, the the more interesting it becomes for both student and faculty member. Um, so, in fact, yesterday I was working with a student who's also one of my internship supervisees, and we were doing essentially what you were just speaking about, but we were doing it in a conversation. And so um, we have the opportunity to sit down and say, what happened with this event that you put on, and how did it go, and what went right, and what went wrong? and um, what I really enjoy is um, really pushing the students to think beyond. So we're able to say, well, what if this had happened and just kind of have a banter about um, different ways that the event could have played out and different decisions. What if they had made a different decision and why did you make that decision? And um, so having them take on perspectives um, that they may not have thought about. And so really that one-on-one -on -one conversation, while it is very time consuming, um, it can be, um, I, th I think, very helpful to push the students into places that maybe they aren't as comfortable to talk about and get them out of that, out of that comfort zone a bit and challenge them to reflect about what happened and what could have happened differently under different circumstances. Um, I think another way to do reflective um, assignments, uh, so to speak, is um, having students come back and really match what they were seeing in that, in that context out, out in the real world with their textbooks. And so having them um, after the fact, not uh, before the fact and preparation is, is, of course, very important. But then coming back and saying, oh, but I thought that this was that term and that that was that term. And, and sometimes this leads to them understanding the nuances of a theory or why this theory might have some holes in it or what are some of the gaps in what we do know. Um, so I think that that kind of backwards learning, um, bringing their experience back to the textbook, back to what other people have, have learned before them so that they don't um, misunderstand that they're the first person to ever study this particular topic and they really do give credence to, to um, all those that have come before them. I think that's a really helpful thing. And group discussions, group uh, reflections can also be really helpful because people may have experienced totally different things even at the same um, off-campus site or in a capstone course or um, in a writing experience, a, you know, in-depth writing experience. They may have had totally different um, ideas and so they can learn from each other as well. Yeah, one of the examples that you brought up um, that one of our professors actually did was she teaches um, substance abuse class in kinesiology for our health promotion degree. And she had them interview either a um, someone who was a substance abuse counselor or um, someone who was recovering, who was who was willing to be interviewed. And afterwards, they had to relate it to the things that they that they learned in class about um, about substance abuse. And um, in talking to the professor that taught that class, it was really interesting to see how students had very big misconceptions about what substance abuse looked like, mm -hmm. the demographic that was impacted by mm -hmm. it, um, their preconceived notions, and having that reflection really opened their eyes to uh, to the fact that they were misguided initially. And so that type of reflection I find so, so valuable. Interesting. So how can faculty collaborate with other faculty members and other academic support services to increase incorporate high impact practices in courses across our institution. Great. I mean, I guess I'm thinking um, most immediately about the public demonstration of competency. Mm -hmm. So faculty can pair together and say, so I'll invite my class to your class so that my students are presenting not just to the people that they know and they've been in class with for 15 weeks, but um, to people that they may not know. Kind of strangers in the audience is a great um, 
a great skill to learn in terms of public speaking. Uh, so they can they can tag team like that or have students if they're engaging in a survey or anything like that, they can use other classes um, as as part of their subject or their population of study. Um, I think that that's that's a one way that that faculty can collaborate, or they might be teaching on a similar topic but different angles. So whether it's the neuroscience angle from I'm in psychology, so maybe one one um, angle to um, you know depression. If you're studying depression, is from the neuroscience side, and they're learning about that in one course, and then from another course, they're really looking at medical models and um, behavioral analytic models of how to deal with and treat depression. So I think there's a lot of ways to be creative um, and work together. So for our um, FLC over the summer, we created a box folder. Um, and so people upload assignments that they've done in their class um, in, with the understanding that anyone can you know, take them for, uh, for what they are and then edit and tailor them to their, uh, their course or their material. But for me, it's really interesting to see that I think that some of my, my assignments are really awesome and wonderful. And there are other people in political science that are doing really awesome and wonderful assignments as well. And so I can kind of take those assignments and integrate it into my classroom just to, to change things up and to uh, just to make it a little bit more more engaging. Um, and I think having having people just be willing to have the conversation about what they're doing really helps it helps us understand that other people, one, are doing it, and two, there are challenges and successes to it, and being able to communicate that with one another has been has been very helpful, especially in trying to collaborate and figure out, you know, how can we, uh, how might we be able to work together in something. I had, um, before, so we don't have HPE here anymore, but when we did have a few, uh, probably like six or seven years ago, there I had a PE student who was doing student teaching, and um, there was another music education major who uh, they collaborated together and led a PE class with musical instruments, mm. which was, I, I was blown away. It was, it was amazing. And I loved that collaboration. I thought that was one of, one of the most awesome things that I had seen uh, student teachers really take the initiative and want to do that. And that's just, you know, th and those were students that took that initiative. Uh, but that's just an example of how we can integrate two things that you might not find to be related and and make them even more exciting for the students. And the students didn't know that they were getting, you know, physical activity mm -hmm. and learning how to, you know, count beats and whatnot, but like it was it was really cool. It was really loud. It was an elementary <laughs> school, but it, it was it was also really really cool. Yeah, that's that's such a great example. I was looking here at the opportunities to discover relevance of learning through real world experiences, um, one of the elements. So those students were able to really see how music mm -hmm. can integrate into health. And mm -hmm. I mean, who of us has not <laughs> enjoyed a walk better with some music yeah. and um, that kind of thing. So um, seeing that seeing that work in real time with real people and children mm -hmm. is, is pretty cool. Yeah. It obviously left an impact on you. You remember it, but probably even more so, obviously, for the students yeah. that, it, yeah. that experienced it. So for that's sure. really neat. Yeah. So what about for fully online courses and faculty who may not see their students or have a lot of interaction with them? What are some tips for using high impact practices in those courses? That is such a relevant question to today's world. Mm -hmm. um, we have so many classes moving online and even full programs moving online. And so we really want, as educators, those those courses to and those degrees to be worthwhile, right? So I first and foremost in my mind is expectations, setting appropriate expectations. Um, there's a lot of... Um, feeling that if it's an online course, it's going to be easier, it's going to take less time, and um, that might be the case in, in, in for some people, but um, it shouldn't necessarily be the case, right? It should be the online courses have the same rigor um, built into them that um, a face-to-face -face course does. And so I think it's really on the on the faculty member to set those high expectations and challenge students so that they can't just write a, um, 
a response. And as long as they write 250 words, that that's, you know, they've done their job. Um, so there there needs to be a lot of oversight by the faculty member to make sure that they are are keeping the students accountable to the to the teaching mission. And I think, I mean, there's other ways they can do, they can videotape themselves for demonstrations mm -hmm. of their competence, whether that's, you know, um, doing physical therapy with a client or whether that is, is reading a poem, you know, whatever mm -hmm. that might be. Um, I think there's definitely ways to incorporate these practices, um, certainly intensive writing, which is one of the elements is, um, is a wonderful thing to do with an online course because there can be so much individual time that you can dedicate to writing. Um, and so that's, that's another option. Yeah, and I think service learning could be one that could be integrated in fully online classes because we don't know where the students are living. They could be in Augusta, they could be you know, in Florida, they, they could be wherever. Um, but giving them those expectations and those guidelines to complete some sort of service learning in the community that they're a part of. Um, that way they are still engaging online, but they're also being active outside of you know, the web-based classroom. Um, I do think it takes, I would argue it probably takes a little bit more intentionality on the faculty who's teaching that class um, because you, you don't get to see them. And a lot of times they are asynchronous and so you really have to be mindful of how you want to integrate these and what's the best route in which to do so. Um, I'm actually moving one of my only in-person classes online this summer, and so these are all the things that I'm readily thinking about right now. And I already told the students in this semester, I was like, I'm going to ask you all to do like an informal kind of focus group of what what parts of this class do you think are going to be very valuable online and what parts do you think are going to need some extra work. And I think we take for granted the input of students sometimes, and they're the ones that we're teaching. So we should really think about how can we best engage them, and their feedback is so valuable. Because a lot of my students, they they don't want to do online classes, but some of them really, uh, really do want to do online classes. So how do we make that experience still as valuable to those that are online versus those that are in person? So that's definitely going to be something that I'm I'm already thinking about right now. Well, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, let's take a quick break. We'll come back with our continuing the conversation question. Hi, I'm James Garner, Associate Director of the Center for Writing Excellence, and I'm excited to share with you about this great resource. Center for Writing Excellence, housed within the Pamplin College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, offers personalized writing and speaking support to the entire Augusta University community, including undergraduate students, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, residents, and faculty. Faculty are encouraged to use the center's one-on-one -on -one consultations, either online or in person, to improve their writing process and meet writing and research goals. Whether you're working on a funding application, a publication, or a presentation, our team of professional writing consultants can help. Learn more about the Center for Writing Excellence at our website, www.augusta.edu. Slash CWE. Contact us by phone at 706-737-1402 or by email at cwe at augusta.edu. We look forward to working with you. As we wrap up, I want to ask y'all our continuing the conversation question, which is asking what tips would you give faculty who are ready to get started with high impact practices in their course? Dr. Davis? Yeah, I think first of all, they just need to jump in. They need to, um, you know, read the material that are out there so they're familiar with what some of the options are. And um, especially finding other faculty who have already implemented, say, a capstone course or research that is embedded into the course. That person, I'm sure, will be able to tell you a lot of um, things to do and not to do. So we, um, I think that. Finding experience in others is one of the most helpful ways to navigate where to get started for yourself and start small. Yeah, I would definitely agree with starting small and also kind of letting go of our ego, um, recognizing that this is going to be new thing. These are going to be new things that we're going to be learning. So it's OK to to be a novice. We're all beginners at some point. But, you know, let's not let our ego get in the way of trying to be a better educator. Um, and then they can also look up the USG Momentum course uh, for HIPS um, and then utilize the Center for Instructional Innovation. Um, I feel like sometimes that goes underutilized and that can be very valuable for professors who are really trying to get started but maybe don't know where to start. Um, and util utilizing that resource can be extremely valuable. 
Well, thank you all so much for being here, uh, and I appreciate this great conversation on high-impact practices. What uh, platforms can listeners connect with you on? So if students want to follow me, um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter um, at Dr. Han Ben. Two N's in, in both Han and Ben. You will find me. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thanks again so much. I also want to thank our listeners. Please take a moment to rate, review, subscribe, and share Speaking of Higher Ed. We release new episodes the third Wednesday of each month in spring and fall semesters. And you can find the resources we discussed today on our show page at augusta.edu forward slash innovation. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash A-U-G-C-I-I. And you can also email us at cii at augusta.edu. Just add podcast to the subject line. Speaking of Higher Ed is produced by the Center for Instructional Innovation at Augusta University. 